Hey everyone, welcome along to Music Victoria's Ask Us Anything forums. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Give us a wave if you can. Yeah, cool. Um, today's session is all focused around uh, streams of opportunity during this really challenging time of lockdown. Um, firstly, though, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands in which we're all zooming in from today. Uh, I myself am on Rwandari land of the Kulin Nation, and I pay my respects and gratitude to elders past and present and emerging, and give a warm welcome to any First Peoples that are with us today. I'd also like to give you a heads up that this session will be recorded uh, to be uploaded to Music Victoria's online professional development resources on our Facebook and uh, YouTube. So please stay online if you're comfortable with that. Um, but only the speaker's video frames will be on the recorded file. So all good there. Um, yeah, so again, welcome to Ask Us Anything. We're running these fortnightly Q&A forums for the next little while in this period of uncertainty where there are heaps of questions. And each fortnight, um, we've got a stack of ACE speakers specialising in different areas of the music bits. And we hope that this provides some like consistent transparency to, to music industry support. And it's always great to see some actual faces while in isolation. Um, today, you have access to um, a wealth of knowledge. Jamie Goff, General Manager of Native Tongue Music Publishing. Sarah Hamilton, the Regional Manager at Ditto Music. Joe Syme, Director of Hotel Motel Records and Pie Eater and Will Evans, artist and label ambassador at Bandcamp. Um, so yeah, he, as, as I mentioned, um, everyone's gonna be on mute, sorry. Um, but you're welcome to send through chat uh, questions via the chat function and we'll um, yeah, address them there. But there have been a lot of questions that have already been sent in. Um, so we might kick off with that. Um, and Maybe we'll start with Joe, uh, Syme. Um, Joe, could you give us some background into Hotel Motel and, and Pie Eater and what the artists you represent do and are? Sure. So um, they're both small Melbourne-based record labels. Um, Pie Eater is the older one. Uh, I run that with my bandmate, Tom Yansek. We're, we both play in Big Scary and our manager, Tom Fraser. And so we have like, yeah, Big Scary, Number One Dads, um, Slow Dancer, Erling, Christopher Port, and No Mono. And then I started a second record label, um, half as a sort of for some of the artists that didn't really fit the Pi Eater world, um, and also as a bit of a training ground for myself for new roles within label work. So that's got um, people like Cool Sounds, Nat Vesa, and Quivers. Um, and I've all, yeah, so as I said, I'm a musician, so I come from being, you know, a touring artist, a recording artist. Um, and I've also done a bit of uh, bookkeeping, like business management. I was, I was employed at White Sky for many, many years. Um, so yeah, I've got a bit of a, a broad um, experience in music and yeah, it's been an interesting time. So that's the background of my, my work. Awesome. And how have you seen um, release schedules change with COVID-19? Um, I think it's going to depend on the size of the artist. I think um, it's a bigger and smaller problem depending on um, how established they are. I know that like much larger artists and much larger labels are pushing back certain releases because um, either because they can't tour to support it or they can't um, create, like they can't produce the assets that they want to promote the album, you know, from video clips to photo shoots to all those sorts of things. Um, for smaller artists, um, it's actually been not a bad time because there's been a huge amount of vocal support for getting around Australian artists. So I have one campaign running right now for an artist called Nat Vesa and the album's out at the end of next month. And there was a question about whether we should push it because she, she, she's not able to tour. But um, I was pretty comfortable leaving the rollout plan as is. Um, it's almost like leveled the playing field a little bit. Like she wasn't going to be able to be doing international touring. She wasn't going to be able to sell out um, huge venues across Australia. You know, she's very much a developing artist. Um, and 
where I would always have encouraged an artist to tour domestically around a release to sort of help promote that um, community with, with community radio, you know, like your FBI's and your four triple Z's outside of Victoria. Um, but yeah, there's a it's sort of leveled the playing field for them. So that, that was t- totally fine. And we've seen like a great take up of sharing and PR around the campaign so far for her. Um, yeah. So I think it just depends for the, for the artist. And um, Sarah, Hamilton from Ditto Music, you might be able to weigh in on um, any changes to releases from artists from a distribution perspective. Yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. Nice to see some familiar names of the participants. Um, Yeah, at Ditto, we've been really busy. So um, we've had about double the amount of orders that we usually do. So a lot of people are writing and releasing music. And I guess same as what Joe was saying, it kind of depends on the size of the artist and what the campaign was going to be. We've had the release dates change if there was a big tour, um, but otherwise artists are wanting to release at the moment. I guess the thing that I would say is that because there's so much music being released at the moment, it is a little bit cluttered out there. And so I think artists should really think about their own position and whether it makes sense to release or if they're just wanting to release at the moment to keep things going and you know there's also a lot of live streaming happening and you know whenever I jump on Instagram it's just everyone seems to be live and I guess I would just make the point that you know really think about what makes sense for you as an artist and that might be to just sit back for a couple of months and see how this all plays out or if you weren't going to tour anyway and you really want to keep the Spotify algorithm going and it makes sense for you, absolutely release. But yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot um, going online at the moment. Awesome. Um, hey, Will Evans from Bandcamp, um, would you like to also just speak to this point a little bit around um, releasing during this time and any advice you have for, for artists? Yeah, sure. So I, uh, something that I put my foot in my mouth the other day, I was talking to an artist about delaying a release, whether they should do it, you know, the editorial stuff that Bandcamp is available to do is really cluttered at the moment because a lot of people are putting releases up. Um, So, you know, I went through all that stuff and maybe you should wait. Um, And they made a really good point that was, um, well, I actually need to like put this out so that I can make some money so I can pay some bills, which I, naively didn't think about at all so um that's also really important people are interested in buying music at the moment um band camps are seeing a, a quite a large rise in traffic because people know that we are quite favorable on our terms to what we give or what artists take out of the money that they receive from what they sell so um yeah people are interested in helping artists that way so yeah i mean we see a lot of people putting up demos, live recordings, kind of just anything that they have that, they have that um, yeah. really gets uh, people excited. Um, some stuff gets delayed, some stuff's actually been brought forward. It's, it's totally just dependent on what you want to do as, as an artist. But, you know, something to remember is when you're putting music out there, you're not just like throwing it into the abyss. A lot of the times you're giving it to the people that, you, the fan base that you might already have. So, you know, maybe they want it. And, you know, maybe it doesn't mean that you'll put this, maybe you don't put your album out right now, but, you know, there's definitely ways that you can put stuff out now, make a bit of money in this interim period to help you along um, at this time. Yeah. And, well, do you have any insights into streaming numbers um, or, like, digital sales, physical sales? Um, Yeah, amongst the increased period of traffic. Yeah, so Bandcamp's about... Uh, I don't, I don't, I don't want to say the wrong thing here, but I think we're, it's about, it's almost double what we normally do, um, which is really great. Um, particularly when I think streaming numbers in America are down. I think here they're up. I don't know. I don't really pay too much attention to that, but we're definitely doing, there's a lot more um, stuff being uploaded to the site. There's a lot more people buying. There's a lot more people paying above what they are uh, meant to be paying. So for Bandcamp, you can pay more if you'd like. Those, um, those numbers are up as well. So people are really coming out and being very generous um, to, help, to help artists at the moment, which is really, really great to see. 
I was just going to say, um, yeah, I think the global trend is that Spotify streams have actually gone down about 7%. Um, and YouTube has gone up. Um, but yeah, I think a lot of people really, as you're saying, will want to support artists at the moment. And so kind of making a call out to fans and directing them on how they can do that is a really good thing to do because, you know, people really want to get behind artists. But yeah, the, the general trend is that um, streaming on Spotify has gone down slightly. And I think the kind of music that people are listening to generally has changed as well. A lot of people are wanting to listen to kind of really familiar things and certain genres to kind of lift their mood. Um, so that's interesting as well. That is interesting, Sarah. Um, I read that people aren't listening to like, um, you know, hip hop and club music as much because they're not going out as much. Um, what insights do you have on listening trends? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I'm doing that a bit as well. Sometimes it's a little bit frustrating. It depends. And I guess people's behaviour has changed so much because they're not commuting to work and that's often a time when they would listen to music. Um, not going to the gym, so beast mode and all of those kind of playlists, probably not seeing as much attention. Um, and I think people really want to generally lift their mood. Um, but also, I think there are a lot of music fans out there that are keen for new things from their artists that they follow as well. And um, yeah, so I don't, I don't want to deter anyone from putting out new music because I think there's still a, a base for that. Um, but it's just interesting that, you know, everyone's behaviour has changed, therefore what people are listening to as a whole has changed and preferring that uplifting music and those kind of genres and even Spotify are presenting those kind of playlists, playlists as well, more um, at the forefront. So um, it might be mood boosters or morning motivation or something like that to try and help lift people's mood. And I think people are listening to more radio as well, wanting that, companionship because they might not be talking to real people so yeah it's interesting mm, super interesting um yeah, hey, i know and um sorry i know just to jump in on that i know there was a study done in europe on um the playlist sort of the rise in digital so i'm getting a bit of an echo um the friday night and saturday night used to be the big jump so it'd be kind of meander throughout the week and then huge jump. And in, um, well, it was a study of most European and American. It was just a flat straight across the weekend, which um, wasn't normal. So people aren't having house parties or not supposed to. And um, it's not that big weekend jump. So that's partly that and commuting, I think, caused the drop off. Yeah. Yeah. Um, hey, Jamie, while you're here, for people that might not know about music publishing, can you provide a bit of background on it and what kind of publishing opportunities are available to artists? I can. Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Um, I'm Jamie Goff from Native Tongue Publishing. We're an independent publisher based in Melbourne with an office in Sydney and an office in Auckland, New Zealand. Um, Publishing's a bit of a bit of Pandora's box as far as um, how deep you want to dive, but essentially we represent the copyright in the song, um, and that involves a relationship with the songwriter, and we then represent and register those rights uh, with various collection societies, societies around the world uh, to make sure the songs are registered and various income streams and royalties can be collected. Um, the main income streams are mechanical royalties, which uh, these days is largely some of the things we've talked about. So streaming income from the various DSP, so Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon, um, and um, yeah, sales also from mechanicals, which is obviously downloads um, prior to that CDs and vinyl. Uh, mechanical sort of stems from the actual pressing of a record um, there's a mechanical royalty to be paid to the composers of of that material um, so you know very common i think when when the sort of record was kind of very i guess peaking and um i guess i don't know what what year the record started but it used to be they'd go and cut a single and sometimes that day the single would be sent on vinyl to the radio stations and a lot of covers back in the day so the songwriters were always credited 
and there was a royalty payable to those songwriters, despite the artist being whoever it may have been. So Elvis, for example. Um, so the songwriters would always receive a royalty for the performance, the public performance of those songs and the sales of those songs. So mechanical royalties when referred to are mostly sales related, um, these days streaming. Then there's public performance royalties, which come from a whole gamut of areas. So anything where the music's being performed or heard or played in public, um, there should be a royalty that flows back to the songwriter. Um, common is live, live performance and concerts and theatres and uh, radio and television and other broadcast mediums. Um, there's other, like all gyms, for example, fitness clubs and gyms, restaurants, pubs, bars, clubs, um, hairdressing salons, anywhere that has a place of business, has music on, needs a licence with uh, various PRO in Australia, that's APRA AMCOS, um, various other ones around the world. Um, and then a third kind of major stream is synchronisation, which I think everyone's heard of sync or everyone's seen film and TV and had heard a song and thought oh that sounds great and that song really elevates the scene or that theme song is you know really a good start for the show or you know that song really makes that advertisement um so our job is to represent the copyrights uh in the song and in songwriters and negotiate terms for those rights with the third party um and issue a license so that that company has a piece of paper that says they're allowed to use that song in the agreed uh, production for the agreed amount of time and for the, the fee that was paid, etc. Um, so they're kind of the three main areas that publishers work in. Um, and yeah, yeah, like I said, you can go pretty deep on each one and there's various other things we do as well. Nice, Jamie. Um, have you seen a hit to sync opportunities due to TV and film, um, filming being put on hold or, you know, gyms being closed, that kind of thing? Yeah, um, the initial hit was obviously, you know, I think pretty immediately once the no gatherings of over 500 people, which sounds like a dream to be able to go to somewhere with 500 people now. But um, when that was, when that came in and then it very quickly became, you know, all live performances were, were banned. Um, that was a initial hit to generally, like an initial hit to the touring musicians and artists and everyone related. So everyone that helps put a show on, as we all know, it's not just the people on stage. That was the immediate hit, but for publishers and songwriters, we sort of receive a delayed income. You know, we're paid three, six, nine, 12 months after the fact. So we're still receiving income now for, you know, uh, royalties were generated in 2019. So we haven't seen a hit to our bank balance just yet, but we know it's coming. So we kind of, can prepare for it um, but there will be a, a loss of performance royalties for songwriters across the board which could range from sort of that 15 to 30 percent at the moment depending on how much longer we, we we go through this but um because that income comes from such a broad range so live is part of that concerts which is a different pool of income is part of that um, fitness clubs hairdressers everything kind of there's different pools and they're distributed in different ways. So it depends on what sort of income you're relying on as an individual writer. Um, if most of your income was from touring and live performance, you probably will see a significant decrease. Um, if you had songs that were regularly played on the radio and therefore they would be receiving the pools from fitness clubs and um, uh, airlines and, um, pubs and clubs and bars and those sorts of things, then it won't be as substantial. It'll be a hit for why we're closed or why we're offline, but it'll pick up again relatively quickly uh, when, when things start to reopen and those businesses start paying their licensing fees again. Um, but sync income really started to slow down for us in February. I think a lot of the international brands knew and could see that this was becoming um, an issue you know, I know that there's, there's been talk of certain world leaders not heeding advice that they should have got in, you know, as early as November that something was brewing and 
Uh, I think some of those international brands that tend to pay, have the bigger licensing briefs, like car brands, um, they're a big, they're a big factor there. They all stopped um, actually creating new ads in this territory or needing new music in this territory sort of mid-February. So that slowed down and it really almost ground to a halt with new things, but started to pick up again in the last couple of weeks, uh, sort of seven days uh, with a bunch of COVID related positive togetherness. We'll get through this optimistic briefs. Uh, so that's been encouraging and you know, we expect that that's going to be a trend in the sync market of, um, get positivity and um, together songs. So for anyone out there with with songs like that, then make sure you've uh, you've got a means to get them pitched. <laughs> nice one. And yeah, like where do you see this market of opportunity for optimistic songs um, being published? Um, yeah, it's, I guess in that sense, I guess there's a few ways to answer that, but it's pretty rare that we would take something on off the back of one song we thought was uh, sync friendly or could be pitched in. Um, but it has happened. Um, yeah, I think we tend to look at, look for a songwriter and look at a, like a body of work or, um, uh, you know, uh, career writer that we can work with for a long time and start a relationship and try and develop that. Um, but each, each relationship is different. So it depends on, on what the songwriter was looking for. And, um, but there are various ways to sort of get your music out there to different sync agents and supervisors and publishers and, and labels as well to, so, to be considered for them to work with you full stop. And yeah, I, I think I'd be probably careful to kind of jump into too many things just because it is uh, an opportunistic time or because of the environment we find ourselves in. You probably want to look at it with a long-term view, uh, make sure it's the right fit and the right company for, for you beyond COVID as well as during. That's good advice. Um, hey, Joe, uh, we've got a question for you. Yeah. Are you looking at expanding your management or label roster during lockdown? Uh, I'm not, and it's not to do with lockdown. It's because in general, I'm just very um, tentative with any new agreements or relationships and all nearly every artist that I work with across the two labels has been a friend beforehand. It's just been someone within my community. Um, I don't really, go out searching for new talent. Um, just That's just the size of our company. Um, and and also just because of all of my writers, like nearly, nearly every one of them um, are working and writing at the moment. And I know that I'm gonna have to um, keep myself available and my resources available for all the releases coming up with who I'm already working with. So it's nothing to do with the lockdown, um, just, just, the, just the nature of my um, setup. Cool. Um, do you think bands will drop their record prices um, during this time to sell more music? Um, I, I saw this question and I, I, I hope they don't and they shouldn't. Um, and in terms of like the price of a record, like there's the vinyl, there's the CD, there's the digital download and then there's just, um, you can set your own price on Bandcamp and then obviously there's just the streaming of which you don't set the price. Um, for physical, especially vinyl, I don't think they should drop the price. One, there's a very slim profit margin, if any, anyway. Um, and two, the appetite for fans to pay pay the bands for what they're putting out is really is really large. And like as as Will was saying, like people are going above and beyond. They're using that option on Bandcamp to pay more than you know pay more than what the artist has asked for. Um, I know that some fans, like a lot of fans, will be um, you know, like, like a huge proportion of the um, population might have lost their jobs, so might have less income or less disposable cash to buy things. But I think that's totally offset by this general wave of, of wanting to support the bands. And, and but, but bottom line, like, I think 
even though vinyl are expensive to buy as a fan, um, unfortunately, when you know the, the supply chain and the costs, um, mostly the bands are at best breaking even usually. So they, I don't think they can drop the price. Yeah. Um, have you seen any changes to physical record sales um, for your artists? Well, yeah, it's jumped. Like it's, it's been awesome. I mean, I think the, that great day that Bandcamp did the, um, the, you know, no fees. Um, I'm fairly sure Will, it was Bandcamp's biggest day, right? You can just. Yes. Yeah. Um, and this isn't CDs, but it is physical. Like it's, it's merch. Um, I, I work out of Sound Merch's warehouse sometimes and they had their biggest day of sales ever for their online store last Friday. Um, and yeah, just through Paeta store. I don't do much physical sales through Hotel Motel, but Paeta, we've had, um, yeah, loads, loads of sales. And it's always very lumpy because it just depends whether an artist is on cycle and if you've got something new released. Um, but across the board, like people are visiting the, the revisiting the back catalog of vinyl. Um, so yeah, it's been a really great time and I'm just really stoked at how fans have responded to um, the situation. That's awesome. Um, Will, did you want to give us some background into um, Bandcamp's recent initiative to, to waive, waive their revenue cut to online sales and how that impacted artists? Yeah, sure. So, like, uh, Bandcamp's relatively socially minded. I mean, we get a lot of people uploading charity-esque releases quite consistently. We've also done some charity drive days in the past for... Uh, the ACLU in the States and the Transgender Law Center, which is in San Francisco. Um, they're usually like uh, around a certain event. I think one of them was from tran um, Trump's ban of trans people in the army. So we did the Transgender Law Center thing then. Um, so we were, we were able to like kind of quickly make these decisions. Um, so yeah, we just decided that turning off our revenue share. So for those who aren't aware, if you put something up on Bandcamp where you take 10% of physical and 15% of digital, 10% um, of digital if you make a certain amount of money or if we, yeah, there's a couple of different right ways to make that happen, but irrelevant. Um, yeah, we kind of decided to, uh, yeah, donate our section of the of, of revenue for sales to, well, not donate it, just not take it. So all that money flows through to artists um, for 24 hours. Um, and we kind of thought that it was going to be relatively successful. Our um, other sales days have kind of, were about three times more successful or more traffic to the site than, than normal. So we're kind of expecting double that, um, but we actually got about five to 10 times, depending on which way you look at it, uh, more traffic than normal, which is really great. So a lot of labels and artists kind of release new music for it. A lot of them, a lot of labels said that they were gonna pass on that money to artists for that day or, or you know, not take their cut as well. So everyone kind of came together really well. Um, so we kind of decided that we would do it again. So next Friday, we are also going to, um, wave our, our cut of revenue for, for 24 hours, which will start Australia time or Melbourne time, I should say. Um, 5 p.m. Friday, the 1st of May and go through to 5, 5 p.m. 2nd of May. Um, and yeah, yeah, that's kind of, that's, that's kind of it. That's awesome. And how can artists prepare for that next Friday? Um, is there any tips you would give them to really capitalise on that opportunity? Yeah, yeah. I would say, I mean, telling people about it is really beneficial. I think the reason why it was so popular is that fans in particular want to support their favourite artists. It's kind of wasn't so much that it wasn't really the artists and the labels that got behind it in a really crazy way. It was that fans really wanted to do it. So that's why it kind of um, it was kind of shared quite widely on the internet, um, on social media, just by non-musicians which was really great um i think a lot of people like found out about Bandcamp for the first time on that day because their favorite artists were like you should go over here and buy something from us and help us out so 
you know, I don't think you necessarily need to upload new music. A lot of people have been doing that for this next thing um, because of what actually, because we get so much more traffic, the site actually is probably slows down a little bit. So it's almost better that if you plan on uploading music, perhaps upload it a couple of days before so that um, the you know email goes out to your fans that you've uploaded that. Um, it won't slow actually getting it on the site, but those notifications might slow. So, you know, I think letting people know about it because it really is to do with fans wanting to help. So that's kind of the best way to do it. Awesome. May 1st. That's great. Can't wait. Yes. Um, hey, Sarah, um, do you have any tips on how to get added to playlists as an independent artist? It seems to be a dark art someone has sent in. It is a bit of a dark art and it changes all of the time as well. <laughs> but at the moment, as an independent artist, if you want to get added to Spotify playlists, there's playlists across all of the different platforms, but for Spotify, then you need to make sure you've been approved for Spotify for Artists, which you can do before you even release any music and your distributor can send you back links for that. And then you need to submit um, ideally at least seven days before release. So you need to submit this form on Spotify for Artists um, and basically tell them all about your music and, and sell it to them a bit and explain the instruments and the mood and that kind of thing. Um, so that's one way to do it as an independent artist, completely free, anyone can do it. But then I'd also recommend that artists reach out to a few potential partners. So at Ditto we do it, um, you know, Gyrostream does it, Believe, The Orchard, AWOL. Basically at Ditto we can partner with artists and then we sign a distribution deal and then we also advocate for that artist to get them onto playlists as well. Um, and we are discerning when it comes to the artists that we pitch for playlists, just so we're not sending Spotify 200 artists a week. Um, but, you know, it can really help to have someone in your corner also pitching it to Spotify and then to Apple Music and Nightlife who put music in gyms and clubs and that kind of thing as well when they're open. Um, so, yeah, there's a way you can do it yourself. And I see a lot of artists have success pitching it themselves. But... Um, there was an interesting article written recently, which I'll share with everyone. It was written by Arlo um, from Zellon. And I thought it was a really good point of just not always concentrating on the playlists and thinking about building up your fan base, building up your followers on Spotify, really building up an engaged audience and not just seeing playlists as the be all and end all. Um, and obviously it's a really important part of what we do at Ditto. It's an important part of revenue. It can be great for artists to be noticed, but there's a lot to be said for just really building up your core fan base as well and building that up via followers on Spotify. I always tell people to use Spotify like it's a social media platform. So make it look really good, engage with it a lot, look at all of the data, um, you know, add merch onto your Spotify page, add your bio. So basically use it like a social media platform and try and build up your followers just like you would with Instagram. Um, and then playlists, um, will come at the right time and always pitch yourself a playlist, but look for a partner that can help as well. Awesome advice. I think just to pick up from what, what Sarah was saying, I think one thing to keep in mind is if you are constantly focusing on getting on a playlist or whatever playlist you're targeting and you get on but your skip rate is high or you're not trending well with the amount of time people are spending listening to your music, then it actually works against you. So like what Sarah was saying, if you have doing the right things and you've got people engaged with you on Spotify, when you are on a playlist, you're more likely to, that engagement likely to be picked up by the algorithm and maybe will result in you getting on another playlist and therefore slowly spreading. So it's kind of like with, um, you could easily get your CD into a shop back in the day, but if no one was buying it, it would come back as a return. And what have you gained? Um, so it's it's just a different platform for everything and um, you've got to be doing the hard work and around it to encourage people to want new music. Point. Um, Spotify for Artists have just announced a new feature, the Artist Fundraising Pick. Um, Sarah, do you want to tell us a bit about that if you're, if you're across it? 
Yeah, no, I was going to mention that as well. I haven't delved too deeply into it, but we received an email from Spotify with some more info. So I, I can share that as well with everyone. But basically artists will be able to put on their Spotify profile um, different charities or sorry, they can choose one charity that they'd like people to donate to. Um, and so Support Act, for example, is one of those options, which is really great. Um, so yeah, I think it's a cool initiative that they've launched. Um, they, they can also um, set up their own GoFundMe or their own PayPal as the, as the charity themselves rather than donating to a, an established charity. Um, so that's kind of cool. It kind of brings it closer to the Bandcamp world where, you know, people are only, artists are only receiving 0 0.0007 cents per stream, but for the fans who are, who are a bit savvy and aware of that um, low reven revenue through those platforms, so they can, um, they can you, know, you know, click, click, click to click donate directly to, 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 to artists to artist now on that, with yeah. that feature. Yeah, that's such a good point. And I think some artists have a bit of trouble, and I totally understand this, of um, directing people and, and kind of asking for what they want. But I mean, one of the great things about Bandcamp, and we always push everyone to, to use Bandcamp as well as someone like Ditto, but you can package things up how you want and at the price points that you want more so, whereas, you know, with Apple and iTunes and Spotify, you really have to play with their rules, um, abide by their rules, sorry. So I think it's good for artists and managers to really think about what's the best package that they can put together that their fans will like the most, what's the right price point, and then direct people to that. Thanks, guys. Thanks, um, guys. Someone has sent in, what streaming platforms have the highest cut for artists per stream? Uh, I believe it's Tidal, but you've got to weigh up, you know, the cut per stream and then how many people are actually using the platform. So with Ditto, I think about 72% of all of our revenue for all of our bands across the world comes from Spotify. So even though Spotify are paying out less per stream, more people are using that platform and there's more action happening. Um, so yeah, Spotify is quite low, Tidal is much higher but then not as many people are using Tidal. There's not the same kind of opportunities there. So our advice is always put your music everywhere, including the weird Russian store you've never heard of and Melon in South Korea. Put it on Bandcamp as well. And then, you know, direct your fans on where you'd like them to go. But a lot of people are using the smart links that you would have all seen. And basically it'll list the different um, options because most people are loyal to what they use. So I'm not going to, listen to someone on Tidal when I use Spotify. So yeah, having having your music everywhere and giving people the options so they can choose where they want to listen to it from. But also I think don't be shy to package something up like a special pack with some merch involved or you know a deluxe edition and then do a special post and, and tell people they'll really be supporting you if they head to Bandcamp on the first of May, for example. Mm, nice one. Someone's actually asked, how can artists set up merch sales via Spotify? Yeah, it's a thing called Merch Bar. Um, so it syncs in automatically. So it's just merchbar.com. And basically it can sync in with Spotify. And then you've probably seen it sometimes when you go to someone's Spotify page, you'll see the T-shirts and that kind of thing for sale. So yeah, check out Merch Bar. I might, um, unless they've improved recently, um, as a non, like I had a really tough time getting stuff on Merch Bar. Um, one situation was they were listing an artist's vinyl for like $76 because they were listing it from some Merch Bar approved retail store that was based in Canada. So you lived in Melbourne, you wanted to buy a Melbourne band's vinyl, but it was listing it at some international price. I, I tried contacting them set up my own account and it was just like they were like oh we've got a backlog of applications so it was a bit of a nightmare so um i would recommend teaming up with a retailer who already has a deal with them um so i know like i don't want to just spruik one company but i know that sound merch have sorted that out um so if you're on sound merch's online merch store you'll also appear on i mean i think you have to ask, ask them but you know you can use the merch bar function in spotify and it, now YouTube has a great integrated merch um, sort of similar thing. So like things like 
if you're watching the band's video clip, um, a little sticker will sort of slide up saying you can buy their merch here and I, that might also be through Merch Bar. Um, so yeah, I try directly. They might have improved their customer service, but it was a really tough time for me um, early on, like not, not too long ago. Ash, you're on mute. Thanks. In the chat function, that they can't get merch bar working either. So maybe there's a bit of a, a need for some support there uh, in the future, which we might be able to look into. Um, hey, Will, on Bandcamp, um, can you provide uh, any support with accurately? Um, calculating international shipping costs when different company, uh, different countries rather have different rates and that kind of thing? Yes, yeah, so this one is uh, pretty tricky slash sensitive at the moment just because the shipping prices have changed recently. So if anybody here has got a Bandcamp page and is selling merchandise and hasn't changed or checked what their shipping prices are at the moment, I would highly suggest going and doing that um, quickly before you get a sale and lose $20 to try and ship a cassette that should have cost two bucks to New Zealand and now it costs 25. Um, so yeah, check that. Another good thing is on that, if you've got a few different um, shipping, uh, uh, different items, um, you, you can actually, we have a bulk edit feature. So if you just go to your Bandcamp page, so whatever your Bandcamp page is, forward slash bulk underscore edit, you can, um, on the fly kind of change a lot of different details. I mean, that's might not be that necessary at the moment, but just something to uh, factor Will, in. what's that link again? It's uh, whatever your band camp is, yeah. forward slash bulk underscore edit. Surely you know about this, Joe. No, I um, can't believe I don't. This is great. Well, I just I just fixed everything with the new, new shipping after getting very stung, so yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's been pretty brutal for some people, which is which is a shame. I don't think uh, Australia Post kind of let uh, people know widely enough. Uh, I think some kind of bigger artists and labels were would have would have gotten some sort of email, but or were at least savvy enough to know. But there's definitely a lot of people that didn't really think that it would be a problem, which is understandable. Um, uh, we don't do shipping by weight, which is kind of frustrating-ish for. Uh, for some Australian labels and artists. So uh, I think the best thing to do usually, we can, we can, you can actually change um, where the, where uh, you can change shipping price based on the destination. So you can have different prices for say Europe as a whole or completely separated out until I think it's about 15 different, uh, different destinations. So um that can be really if you you know if you if you start selling merch and you and you're selling internationally, which is kind of fifteen percent of sorry fifteen fifty percent of sales uh, cross border. So if you're selling something on Bandcamp, there's a really good chance that someone in the middle of wherever country is going to buy your stuff, which is really great. But you don't want to end up losing your entire profit margin on your limited edition one hundred and fifty copies, twelve inch to some annoying shipping price thing. So definitely do as much research as you can. At the moment, I think it's like $25 minimum to send anything anywhere overseas. So definitely go and change that for the next time. And will Bandcamp be looking at making bundling deals available? Uh, that is a good question. Um, so currently you can't do any bundling on the site. Um, one thing that I do suggest people do is you can create bundles as as merch items, but there's no they don't link into each individual merch item. So I think it's something that we're definitely looking at. Um, we're actually not a huge company, despite what some people might think. So we don't have a lot of developers able to work on every single suggestion all at once. So I th um, it's definitely been discussed. So I'm not sure what the time would be on that, but I'm not currently. Cool. Um, hey, Jamie. Um, someone has sent in, uh, I'm an independent artist. Do I need to have a team around me in order to be published or can I be self-managed and self-released? 
Um, short answer is yes, you can be self-managed, self-released. Um, we have often signed a songwriter that we're the first member of the team. Um, and you know, when that happens, it's generally early on um, in their career. And you know, we see it as by being part of the team early, we can help bring other members of the team on. And um, there's a lot of, yeah, there's a lot of if onlys in the music industry. So, oh, if you hear it all the time, oh, if only you had a label and if you had an agent, or if you had a, you know, song on this playlist and if you had a publisher, I don't know. But so sometimes you have to be first in and, you know, not be afraid to be, if, if you back it or if you think you can work with it, not be afraid to be that first member of the team. And um, I think it, yeah, the industry does work like that if, you know, if we see a, equally a songwriter who has been signed to a label or um, has a great manager but nothing else, then that adds weight to to them. And if you like their music and they've got another member of the team, then it's easier to get the, the next member. So I think we rely on that sometimes to be, you know, the last member. But it's sometimes when you're the first member, um, yeah, it's because you feel like you can you can help and you can work with it. Uh, so no real hard and fast rules. Cool. And if an artist was, you know, watching today and in, interested in exploring their publishing opportunities, how would they go about that with Native Tongue? Um, it's, we, we don't, we do accept, we do have like a demos at nativetongue.com.au. Uh, address where people can send unsolicited material and for consideration it does get listened to and um, eventually um, but yeah we've often sort of reflected on this and there have been writers that we've signed that have come to us unsolicited and ended up that way but very few you know the majority will come from like a big um, resources our existing pool of songwriters uh, and then the extension of their teams um, or labels or managers or lawyers um, or us you know seeing something live or sort of fumbling us you know stumbling across it um, you know, through those means but yeah very rarely is the kind of random email out of the blue the the one that kind of catches your attention um, but it does happen, so I can't sort of say don't do it because if you don't put yourself out there, you never know. And, um, so, yeah, does that kind of answer that question? Yeah, totally. Um, do you I think, have... oh, sorry, the, to kind of give you the, the, an answer of the actual question, uh, <laughs> to sort of pass on would be, I'd say if you really want to work with a certain company or you, you're looking for a publisher, then um, definitely reach out and get your music to those people, but also try and target other members of your team that you think are going to help as well. You know, it might be that you get one or two before you get the publisher. Or... Yeah. And do, I, do you have any predictions for what um, publishing opportunities could look like if this lockdown period goes on for a really long time um, and the main avenue of, you know, opportunity of touring and that um, isn't available. Um, yeah, what do you see as um, the new landscape for publishing for artists that might become, you know, maybe one of the main op opportunity streams? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I'm definitely more of a glass half full type, type of person. So it's a hard question to think too, that this is going to drag on for too long. But um, I think... Music, the, you know, the positive thing is that, you know, I'm pretty thankful that I work in the music industry is that it has proven itself to be um, not 100% not crisis proof, but definitely has made it through a few recessions that we've been involved with. Um, relatively like scathed, but relatively unscathed and bounced back and often been stronger for it. So I think, sorry. So joys of being outside this company, but um, I think um, you know, as we talked about at the start of the call, consumption is up in some areas, down in some areas. I think that'll continue, and 
um, if this does become the new norm, that will sort itself out and be <coughs> something we can rely on. Uh, well, we know it's streaming's down in these areas, but you know these specials like Bandcamp doing those sales, they were hit, and there's some attention around records all day and those sorts of things. So you really still build campaigns and target um, the consumer in a different way. So I think there'll always be an avenue for like labels and publishers to release music and be involved in music uh, and therefore participate in that income. Um, if productions can't get made, um, that's going to yeah, have a long-term effect on synchronisation, which, you know, for a long time was the main reason you would consider a publishing deal. Um, and I would always argue that that shouldn't be the main reason. It should be for a, a myriad of reasons. And, and the fact that you need a team to do the, all the services of a, of a publisher. Um, if that does happen, then it's going to be challenging just, you know, for publishers to sign too much new content and promise that, that income stream. You're going to have to think of, you know, a way to, to improve or maintain income streams for, an existing catalog of, of music really um so yeah i don't really um i don't really have the answer if this did drag on as to you know whether we would sign new things or whether we would wouldn't but um yeah at the moment we're still very active and um yeah there's still plenty to get on with and um i think we'll be able to weather it and get through it and um we'll come out of it with a strong roster of songwriters and yeah, nice. Um, Sarah, for, from a distro perspective, if an artist was thinking about getting some extra help and maybe engaging a distributor, how would they go about that with Ditto? Yeah, good question. So um, we have a lot of people contacting us every week wanting our help with playlisting. Um, we also have a radio plugger on board and a publicist so we can do radio and publicity campaigns and that kind of thing as well. So they can just send an email to me, sarah at dittomusic.com. And um, every Monday afternoon, we have my favourite meeting of the week, which is where we listen to all of the stuff that's been sent through. And then we discuss it. And then we think about what we can do with it. Um, and I really liked what Jamie was saying before. Sometimes you need to be the first person to jump on. And we do that at Ditto sometimes. But then I guess we have to mitigate that risk by, you know, often working with artists that are at a particular point in their career. So, you know, out of five acts that we take on for pitching and radio, you know, three or four of them might be established and have some good streams and then we'd be able to take a gamble on one, for example. That's not the exact um, amount, but, yeah, we, we like to often work with artists who are really starting out and at, at the end of the day it comes down to the music and the song. And I think Spotify, you know, for all of their flaws and everything, they they have democratised um, a lot of things in the music industry when it comes to playlisting. And they do often choose artists that are completely independent and it's about a really great song. So we recognise that at Ditto and we'll, we'll often jump on board on a, on a great song and invest in that, that artist. So, yeah, just sending through an email and then we listen to those songs and then make a call. And if it's too early, we'll just say that it's, it's too early, but to keep in touch with us for future. Awesome. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks for the offer of direct contact too. That's awesome. Um, hey, Joe, what um, live streaming is something that artists are looking into right now to stay connected with their audience during this time. Um, have you seen, are there any cool stuff um, your artists are working on from a live streaming point of view? Yeah, I mean, the... the Great, one of the greatest um, successes has been the Isolate Festival for the past five weekends. Five weekends. Um, um, they've had incredible the, engagement and like, you know, art, artists from Courtney Barnett down to the, the really developing really new um, and unknown artists. Um, and I think it's been awesome as like a way to push maybe older bands onto new technology as well. Like um, a lot of the ones I saw from people like, Tim Rogers and um, mental blank, um, Sarah Blasco, like saying, and my, my own band included, it was the first time that we'd use that technology. And um, I think that's going to be a really 
huge positive moving forward is is um, like forcing forcing people to harness this like digital power that we've had for quite some time but haven't given enough t attention to because it was um, because we didn't maybe we didn't need to there was things going well in other areas or we just you know afraid of change or whatever it was or it felt like a young person's thing um, but I think also moving forward we'll have to work out um, you know because because a lot of the live streaming is just free and we've lost our live performance income so where's going to be that line of um, yeah it's great as exposure and you're developing um, your social um, platform but you know are we going to have to monetize or um, I've heard talk of you know people can can do some branding in their life their live streaming which it, it doesn't make doesn't suit every genre doesn't suit every artist um, so yeah, I think it'd be interesting where it goes from now. And there's probably a little bit of live stream fatigue um, in terms of it was a really exciting novelty. And now maybe people have done a, a lot of it. Um, and, and that's just been on the Instagram platform. I, I'm not super engaged with the same functions on like YouTube and Facebook, to be honest. Um, maybe that's the next frontier of just picking, picking each platform and, and getting, getting pro at it for everyone. Yeah, it's certainly an interesting um, new model. We actually did a workshop on live stream, um, live streaming in quarantine last week. Um, if anyone wants to check that out on the Music Victoria Facebook video gallery, you can, you can check that out too. Um, hey, Will, just before we wrap up, um, one final question. Are there any future um, prospects or opportunities for artists to look into on Bandcamp? Um, there's we're obviously working on uh, a lot of stuff um, that are kind of subtle changes on the way that we do things. Um, things change relatively quickly. Uh, something new that we've done is an artist guide, um, which doesn't sound that sexy or exciting, but it is. Uh, if you go to bandcamp.com forward slash guide, um, there's actually a really large amount of information uh, that will definitely help you to do with every single aspect, whether it's how you're getting paid, um, selling your merch, blah, blah, blah. Lots of stuff on there. Uh, it also has a lot of information about how to submit for our editorial, um, which in case you don't know, Bandcamp has an editorial arm. We do five new uh, articles per day. Um, so uh, that will help you. There's a direct email address to the editorial team in New York. You can also contact me with new releases at any point, my email address is just will at bandcamp.com. It's very easy. Um, and yeah, that's that's kind of it. Awesome. Thanks, uh, Will. Ash, if you're just wrapping up, I thought it might be worth uh, expanding on some stuff that kind of Jamie and Sarah were mentioning about like what, it, what people look for when they're signing you or what you can do for yourself to help grow. Um, and I, and like from a label point of view, like, or from any, any part of the team, like no one's going to make you famous or make you successful. Or like they're not flick, flicking a, sw a secret switch. It's sort of like they can augment what you're sort of already doing, I think. And so um, whether it's, you know, putting yourself out there to do co-writing, perhaps not even for your own project, but for other people's projects. And um, we kind of already do it naturally when we're doing gigs and there's three, build, three lineups, sorry, three artists on the lineup and they're building a community that way. And so I think it would be cool to, um, think how you can do that similar community thing, but now online and, you know, people have been covering each other's songs or making playlists and tagging artists in those playlists and stuff. And um, I think, yeah, keep on, keeping on trying to broaden your community and support network um, will be really great. And similarly, like maybe one of the artists that you work with has got a team and you become noticed through those networks um, or one of the songs you co-write for another artist explodes and then you can, you know, then travel forward in the wake of that success. So there's definitely things that you could be doing for yourself, um, which will then make you more attractive to the wider team. Unreal, thanks Joe. It's a great, great note to leave it on. Um, well done, all of our speakers. It's, we're very grateful you were able to share all of your insights today. Um, if anyone wants to refer back to this chat, uh, it'll be on yeah the Music Victoria Facebook video gallery and YouTube and our website. Um, so yeah, thanks to Joe, Sarah, Jamie, and Will.
and we'll see you next time. Thanks, Ash. Thanks, everyone. So. Bye. Thanks, Ash. Bye. Ciao.